Hey, Long Beach. My name is Stephanie Riverma, reporter with the Long Beach Post. And I'm here for today's live chat to talk about air quality with Chris Chavez, Long Beach resident and deputy policy director for the Coalition for Clean Air. Chris, thanks for being here with us. Thank you for having us. Uh, we really appreciate it and uh, uh, look forward to today's discussion. Um, I wanted to start first with if you can kind of give us a brief um, overview of what the coalition does um, and I understand it's uh, statewide as well. Sure. Uh, so the Coalition for Clean Air is an air quality advocacy nonprofit based in Los Angeles. Uh, since 1971, we've worked to protect public health, improve air quality, and prevent climate change. Uh, our work focuses on cleaning the transportation sector, uh, which is directly responsible for about 41% of the greenhouse gas emissions in California, as well as as the leading contributor to, to health harming pollution like diesel particulate matter, uh, which dominates the pollution in the South Coast Bay Area re or South Coast region, so Los Angeles, Long Beach, Orange County. Mm -hmm. um I think uh, right off the bat, one of the first things that everyone noticed during this pandemic was less drivers on the road, which um, helped to contribute to improving air quality. Can you talk a little bit about that correlation? And um, yeah, just talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, so the pandem pandemic and shelter in place order have certainly affected air quality. For, uh, and as you've noted, it's actually improved. Uh, just for context purposes, there are about 8 million registered vehicles in Los Angeles County alone. Uh, a major freeway like the 405 oftentimes sees hundreds of thousands, about over 300,000 vehicles traveling on it each day. Uh, so those vehicles each are uh, putting out pollution and putting out uh, smog, uh, forming pollutants and other things that impact human health. Uh, to be clear, a pandemic is not the way we want to clean the air. Uh, we need to move past the belief that cleaner air and a healthier economy are mutually exclusive. And we really want to emphasize that uh, you can have a strong economy and clean air. Uh, it's also important to note that the rains in March also helped clean up our air significantly. Uh, what we're going to see is, and we have seen, is a degradation in air quality because of the warmer temperatures. Warmer temperatures uh, helps create smog. It, uh, it's a catalyst. It, it, it makes the, the chemical reactions uh, that create smog more likely uh, because of the different gases, different pollutants in the air. Uh, so you're going to see worsening smog because of these warmer temperatures. Um, and despite having the improvements that we saw in these last two months, um, I, I have been reading, um, and it's uh, some of the studies that did come out saying that there's um, certain communities that have been more exposed to air pollution, still have, or still are more susceptible to getting the coronavirus. Can you talk about the link to that as well? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so first, to, there are three basic types of air pollution to understand. The first is greenhouse gases, which many of us are aware of because uh, of the climate emergency. Uh, but there are also smog forming pollutants like oxides of nitrogen, oxides of sulfurs, organic volatile compounds, uh, volatile organic compounds, uh, and, and things like that, which react and help create smog, uh, primarily ozone, ground level ozone pollution. Uh, then there are toxic air contaminants. And again, that's like diesel particulate matter, which has a direct impact in terms of cancer and other uh, health conditions. Uh, smog forming pollutants and again, air, air toxics are really what uh, directly impact human health. Uh, so smog is a major contributor of asthma and cardiopulmonary diseases. As I mentioned earlier, uh, toxic air pollution is a major contributor to cancer and, and also other, has other health impacts. Uh, these diseases damage your body. And basically what happens is when you breathe in smog, when you breathe in an air toxic, it causes damage and that makes it harder for your body to fight infections and perform basic life functions such as respiration. Uh, so certainly... Uh, the, the presence of air pollution and the data that's coming out is showing that the more exposure that people have to air pollution, the greater the impact or the greater likelihood that they're going to suffer from uh, severe COVID symptoms. And I think it's important to note, too, that the communities that are most affected are those that are low-income communities of color as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's one of the things that oftentimes left out of the discussion or overseen or you know, overlooked in the discussion is that impact on 
uh, low-income communities and communities of color. Uh, in fact, the Los Angeles Long Beach region has some of the dirtiest air in the nation. It's important to note that our air is relatively cleaner than how it was 40, 30 years ago, uh, but our the list of cities with our most polluted air, with the most polluted air, uh, is dominated by California. And in terms of ozone pollution, according to the American Lung Association, uh, the Long Beach, Los Angeles area is number one at that list. Uh, and again, in this area, because of the goods movement industry focus that we have here, diesel particulate matter dominates the air toxics that we have here because that's coming from the vo uh, boats, the, the vessels, ocean going vessels, because uh, of the ports, uh, the trucks that run in and out of the ports and out to the distribution centers in San Bernardino and Riverside, and the rail yards. Uh, the rail yards also are a major com uh, contributor to diesel uh, uh, pollution. And again, as you noted, uh, the it's primarily those frontline communities that are the that are built right next to those areas. Uh, these are land use decisions that date back for about a hundred years uh, during the time of racial redlining and things like that. And ultimately, uh, the people that live in those communities today are still suffering from con the consequences of decisions made uh, hundreds of years a uh, hundred years ago. Um, I wanted to also point out something that I was reading in my colleague Brian Addison's uh, article, you know, just kind of seeing the disparities in, Lo in Long Beach. In East Long Beach, there's an average of 16.7 acres of parks per 1,000 residents, where, but in West Long Beach, there is, I think, one acre of park space per 1,000 residents. So, you know, going back to what you're talking about, these, um, these land areas and the way that they're constructing it really kind of contribute to that as well. Right. Well, we saw the the uncertainty with the situation with Takana Park over in West Long Beach, uh, and really, uh, you know, th there is you know park access and park space is kind of part of the broader. It's definitely part of the, the broader environmental justice aspect uh, because ultimately that helps with things like the park space helps with things like the heat or the urban heat island effect. Uh, where you experience warmer temperatures, or what uh, in in areas that are more con have more concrete and asphalt uh, paved areas, uh, housing stock plays a role into that as well. So it's it, you, there's a lot of interconnections to to the environmental justice issues in our communities. And I know um, you grew up in Long Beach too, right, in the Wrigley area. So this is something that's personal to you as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So when I was a kid, I had asthma. And, uh, you know, I, we just kind of took it for granted that it was something I, I had asthma. But then once you think about it, it's like, okay, I grew up between two major freeways, the 405 and the 710, downwind from the refineries, downwind from the rail yards, uh, close proximity to the ports. And I think one of the things I'll, I'll never forget when I was uh, about 15 years old, I was sitting at my computer working on homework and I see these clouds coming over uh, the house and they're very different looking. I thought, oh, it's kind of pretty. Well, what had happened is the one of the refineries exploded, and it wasn't until I turned on the news a few minutes later, kind of figuring out, okay, what's going on, uh, that I found out it was one of the refineries. And uh, fortunately, um, unfortunately, I should say, that's a, a daily occurrence for people who live in those frontline communities, is that they get uh, that sort of pollution uh, as part of their lives. And they, there's some uh, out, uh, astounding uh, pictures of, of communities, particularly like Wilmington, Harbor City, uh, West Long Beach, where you'll see a ton of houses in people's front yards and in the background is the refinery. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's oftentimes that those, the people that live in those communities primarily live there because for two reasons. One, that's what they, they can afford. And two, that is ultimately what's home for them. And I know from my own personal experience, I wanted to come back to this part of Long Beach because of uh, this community is uh, something that I care about. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, home is where the heart is, so. Yeah. Um, and I think the next uh, topic of conversation that people are now getting into after acknowledging, um, you know, now that the air is breathable more than, you know, just a few months ago, is how do we keep it that way, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and just um, a couple of days ago, I was reading about uh, the Trump administration trying to roll back some of these environmental laws um, that kind of that could go against what we're trying to push for. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, we do have an opportunity, a very good opportunity to uh, lock in some of the emission reductions that we have now. Now, granted, emissions are going to come back once people start driving, uh, once the economic activity picks up. 
uh, emissions you know, are part of that, unfortunately. Uh, but this is really the opportunity to invest in cleaner technologies and really require cleaner technologies. You know, look, there's, there's no silver bullet that's going to fix the air, just as there's no silver bullet for COVID-19. There's no silver bullet for climate change. Uh, we, it's going to take a mixture of regulations uh, from the South Coast Air Quality Management District, from California Resources Board, and from EPA uh, to the Environmental Protection Agency uh, to clean our air. Uh, it's going to take investments. It's going to take billions of dollars of investments in, the, in clean technologies. And uh, there are clean technologies currently available now, uh, but ultimately the end goal is to reach zero emissions uh, but th we're still looking at 10, 15 years down the line, maybe, you know, 5, 10, 15 years down the line uh, for when this technology is commercially available. And uh, ultimately, uh, we need to start cleaning our air now, given the health impacts that people are suffering now. So for some of the more um, short term uh, rules that are going on, it, we're, I think we were talking um, before the live chat on this was that some of the corporations are asking for kind of delays in that implementation too. How do you kind of justify wanting to uh, be strict or continue these when there is, you know, an economic down downturn as well? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, it's, as in, we have responded rightly to the COVID situation, the COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic, uh, as a public health emergency. And ultimately, air pollution is on its own a public health emergency. Uh, the South Coast Air Quality Management District puts out a plan. It's called the Air Quality Management Plan. And they estimate every year about 7,000 people, maybe over 7,000 people, die uh, prematurely due to air pollution. Uh, again, kids have asthma. This is one of the highest asthma rates is in this community. Uh, you know, cancer concerns are always going to be prevalent uh, when you're dealing with things like diesel particulate matter or uh, emissions from refineries. And just basic vehicle combustion creates uh, cancerous uh, chemicals, 1,3-butatane, uh, for example. Uh, so it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a lot of, um, it's going to take a lot of effort. Uh, to to create this change, but ultimately we need to. Now, in terms of the economy, it's going to take, again, it's going to take a lot of investment. And one of the things that California has done well at historically is really investing and in supporting our green sector economy. Now, we definitely need to do more. I could go long about how our green sector investments through uh, the uh, cap and trade program that we have here, the California Climate Investments Program, uh, could be more and should be more. Uh, particularly in the transportation space. Uh, but we really need to use the state to, to invest in, uh, in this clean technology and foster that green market, as well as invest in low-income communities and communities of color. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but the funds from the cap and trade program, 35% uh, has to be spent in disadvantaged communities and low-income communities. So 25% of cap and trade funds goes to disadvantaged communities. Uh, and the 10 and 10 percent goes to low income communities throughout the state and surrounding those disadvantaged communities. And that's actually something that Coalition for Clean Air was part of in, in getting that law passed uh, fairly recently. It was uh, AB 1550 in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, we just had a question come in about um, kind of pivoting to how to help um, or this question. Um, anything we can do to have clean air at home or how we can contribute to clean air? Absolutely. And uh, one of the things that Coalition for Clean Air does is a, we started a program called California Clean Air Day. And you may have noticed uh, on the freeways around October uh, signs that say Clean Air Day is coming up. Uh, so what we do is uh, there's a website, cleanairday.org, and we have a Facebook presence, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. And uh, what we do is we highlight different strategies people can take to uh, reduce uh, their own emissions footprint. Uh, so, for example, switching to uh, natural cleaners, uh, cleaners that don't result, release uh, volatile organic compounds. Uh, so, say using bleach, using vinegar, things like that. Uh, commute, uh, when you commute to work, using transit. Uh, a lot of people forget how vital transit is in reducing our emissions impact. Uh, even if you're, if you're ambitious and of, of means, 
uh, using going with an electric car uh, certainly would have um, uh, localized impacts here, some localized benefits. And there are also a number of incentive programs, rebates uh, to both help get the vehicle itself as well as the charging infrastructure for it. Uh, so really, we, we like to highlight those individual strategies through Clean Air Day. Uh, and then you can pledge to take certain strategies. You can also do things uh, as well uh, outside of that, such as contacting your local elected officials and asking them, how are they addressing cli the climate crisis? How are they addressing air quality? Because look, nobody's expecting the average citizen who cares about this issue, but doesn't you know, have the scientific background. Nobody's expecting you to be an expert, but they need to know that this is something you care about. They need to know that this is something that their constituents care about. Uh, so prior to Coalition for Clean Air, I worked at the state capitol for five years uh, for a couple of different state senators. And it's amazing that when you hear just thousands and thousands of calls on a particular issue, uh, whether you agree with them or not, it's, it's impressive. And it's something that uh, elected officials do pay attention to. Um, and along those lines of um, kind of encouraging folks to, to take this on, uh, one of the following question was, uh, do you think encouraging businesses to allow people to continue to work from home when appropriate will help clean air? Absolutely. Uh, what you know, one of the most important things in reducing vehicle miles traveled, the amount of of uh, miles that you're putting on your vehicle on a big scale, is uh, reducing your unnecessary trips. So, for example, there's going to be a board meeting of the South Coast Air Quality Management District this Friday in which they're going to be talking about their emission reductions plans. One of the things that we're going to be advocating for is requiring and really incentivizing uh, more telecommuting options and you know, using this as an opportunity to say, look, this is actually working out fairly well in terms of working from home for those who do have the privilege of doing it. I know that not everybody does have that privilege. Uh, I've been fortunate being able to work from home, but uh, if you have that ability, if your your industry or your 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 business or whatever has the ability to work from home, it certainly has its advantages because it means that not only are you helping contribute to a cleaner environment, but that also means that people aren't driving as much and you don't have to deal with reimbursement requests to for mileage and things like that, or going fly you know flying somewhere to attend a meeting for a day. If it can be done online, I think uh, that's that's definitely a, an option for available at, to businesses. And I think we all got a crash course on Zoom meetings and Skype, so it'll be a lot easier that way too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to know a little bit more about, like, you know, what's some of the projects or some of the um, efforts that the coalition's working on or trying to advocate for right now. Sure. Uh, so again, our, our policy focus has primarily been in California. Uh, one of the biggest policy wins that we actually just had this past year was a bill, uh, SB 210 by Senator Connie Leva. And what SB 210 did, and a lot of people don't realize this, is that currently big rigs are exempt from smog checks. So the big rigs you see going down the freeways, they weren't subject to the same smog requirements that you and I are. What this bill does is it requires the California Air Resources Board to develop a pilot program to do a smog check for trucks. And we worked with uh, the truckers, we worked with the California Trucking Association uh, to, to develop a compromise, develop a solution that will certainly not you know, that, that will minimize any sort of impacts to truckers, especially the owner operators, the people that own their truck and operate as, as small businesses, uh, and really making sure that the trucks are well maintained. And it's kind of both a hybrid, it's a maintenance and smog program. So making sure that their trucks are maintained and safe and not excessively polluting. Uh, it, it's still flexible as to when that program is going to go online. It's still in the pilot, you know, the pilot's being designed right now, but it's something we're proud of. Uh, other things that we work on uh, is, uh, again, as I mentioned, you know, California spends a significant uh, amount of funding through its uh, what's called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. It's our cap and trade revenues. Uh, so what we like to do is really push for investments that maximize uh, emission reductions, uh, both in both for greenhouse gas emissions and health harming pollutants, uh, and then also uh, investing, prioritizing investments in low income communities and uh, disadvantaged communities. Uh, so uh, on, on the budget advocacy side, which that's going to be a difficult uh, lift this year because of this financial situation we're in, uh, we're going to see a lot of reductions across the board at the state. Uh, 
And uh, we know that uh, unless there's a really strong advocacy, uh, clean transportation could very well be gutted uh, this year. Uh, so again, if this is something you care about, make sure you're contacting your legislators uh, and just really engaging at the regulatory side as well. Uh, so engaging with the California Air Resources Board and the South Coast Air Quality Management District. Uh, we do have a couple of other programs uh, that are non-advocacy related as well. Uh, so we do run an air quality monitoring program, uh, in which we've deployed over 200 air quality sensors through in the Southern California region, few in other parts of California. Um, my dad actually has an air quality monitor. I live in an apartment, so I can install one. So he adds it for me. He's just a mile down the road. Um, but basically, it's a little particulate matter sensor, which detects with laser uh, uh, how many part particles are in the air. And then this data is uploaded to a live map that anybody can access. We also do a STEM education program. So we work with middle schools and high schools to do uh, air quality experimentation and incorporate air quality into the science curriculum. Uh, so we've actually worked with a couple of Long Beach schools. So Rogers Middle School and uh, Hughes, Hughes Middle School. Mm -hmm. Yes, Roger, uh, yeah, uh, Rogers and Hughes. And then I believe we're also going to be working with uh, Cabrillo and Jordan this year as well. So I think that's a great plug-in uh, for any schools that are interested. I know they can reach out to you. Um, when I was doing my climate change story um, last year that focused on air quality, I, I learned a lot more about that, that kind of STEM implementation, as well as the, um, the air monitors that you were talking about. Right, yeah. and one, one of the things we like to do with the, the STEM program, the school program, is we like to bring in uh, elected officials and staff uh, to see the students' presentation so that we can, uh, so the students can feel like they're having a direct uh, feedback to their community leadership. And in some cases, I think one of the best examples is, I, I forget which school district, I think it was somewhere in the San Gabriel Valley, uh, where a student did, students did an experiment of outdoor air quality versus indoor air quality. And what they did is they did an outdoor, outdoor sample, and then they went into a fast food restaurant, did an indoor sample. And the indoor air sample in the fast food restaurant was hugely different, much higher than the outdoor sample. So uh, it's uh, it actually caught the attention of regulators to say, look at why this is such an issue. Um, we have another question coming in. Uh, do we see a future conversation of putting regulations on food businesses maintaining a safe radius from refineries or fossil fuel technologies? So ultimately, you know, I, on that specific issue, I'm not 100% sure uh, because how how that's treated, such as like putting like a grocery store or a restaurant near a facility is, a, is what's referred to as a land use decision. And ultimately, uh, the cities, each city has their own land use policy. So what the city of L.A. does even if it has impacts to the city of Long Beach or city of Carson, uh, ultimately it's the city of LA that makes that decision. Uh, what we have been working on, what what the environmental community, I want to make sure that we're you know that there's a broad network of environmentalists in the LA community, environmental justice advocates in the in the Los Angeles region uh, that do incredible work. And what really is important is for elected officials understand that those land use decisions have impacts on uh, on public health, that they have impacts on traffic, they have impacts on air quality. And again, I, I mentioned this earlier. So Wilmington, for example, in the 1930s was a red line community. And it was intentionally so because it was next to the ports, it was next to the oil refineries, and it was in the middle of the big oil field. And uh, Ultimately, if you go through the documents, which are all public, uh, publicly available online, it, it's stunning to see how people back then talked about pre predominantly a Latino community and at that time an Asian community. And ultimately, uh, again, we are still going through the impacts of that 100 years later. And what's really, if, if this is something that you're really concerned about, again, I, I would recommend contacting your city council member, contacting your county supervisor and say, hey, what are you doing to protect my health through land use? How are you going to, you know, housing, yes, we want to make sure that, we, that housing is affordable, that we have more housing. But ultimately, are we putting that housing next to a freeway? Are you putting that housing next to an industrial site? If so, has what mitigation efforts are being done to protect the health and lives of the people that are going to live there. 
I wanted to kind of go back to any of the rules that, um, you know, we have in place regarding clean air protection plans. I know um, for the Port of LA and the Port of Long Beach, they have the uh, uh, clean, zero emissions by 2035. I know it's a long way, you know, 15 mm -hmm. years, but do you think something like this pandemic and, and the, you know, the economy, how it's going can impact something like that? Yes, so as uh, in, I think you alluded to this earlier, I get more explicitly into this, the issue. What uh, we've seen is that a lot of businesses, a lot of regulated entities, uh, polluters are, are a, a, a lot might be the wrong word. Some polluters, some businesses have started asking uh, regulators, so the California Air Resources Board, South Coast Air Quality Management District, and EPA, to hold back or pause regulations. Uh, at the South Coast level, it's primarily specific to industry uh, regulation. So it's 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 so let's say if you're a particular industry, they're asking for a particular regulation to be held back on or to be for reductions in enforcement. At the California Air Resources Board statewide level, what we've seen is, is something similar. I know that the, the Port Authorities Association, the California Port Authorities Association, did ask for a pause on uh, the what's known as the at-birth regulation. And what that is, is a requirement for ships to plug into the electrical grid rather than running off of diesel engines. Uh, it's a regulation that's been in development for a long period of time. And, you know, so they've known this is coming, but they're asking for a pause uh, on, on that rulemaking, which should be coming later this year. Uh, what at the EPA level, we've seen an increase in, in uh, you know, the, the EPA has actually said that they're going to start cutting back in certain areas. And this is something that has been a priority of the Trump administration for the last three, three and a half years. So one of the biggest issues where we've been fighting this on, uh, as both as California and Coalition for Clean Airs in the uh, fuel uh, economy and emission standards, so California has the unique authority to establish its own emissions under the Federal Clean Air Act for two reasons. One, we've been regulating car emissions longer than the federal government by a couple of years. Uh, and two, because we have persistent air quality issues. So California has that special rule to, to, to create our own emission regulations. However, the federal government regulates fuel con. So over the last 20 years, there's been various legal battles between California and the federal government. And that legal battle was settled under the Obama administration. And they actually changed their fuel economy standards to meet California's emission standards, coupling them together, basically. At the end of 2016, the Obama administration did what was called a midterm review of the policy. And they approved of it. Trump administration comes into power, and not only at, at, the, at the request of many auto manufacturers, not only do they uh, create a less strict fuel economy standard, but they also said that Cal they would revoke California's authority to create their own emission standards. So this, that's kind of the, the legal battle that we're going through at the state level uh, with EPA. Uh, so, you know, industries have been using the, uh, the COVID situation, kind of bringing back to your original question. Uh, they have been using the COVID situation to uh, try to delay regulations, particularly regulations that are expensive or regulations that will have a significant impact. Uh, and to be honest, they have actually had some success. Uh, there have been some reasonable changes such as uh, expedited permitting for industries that are related to COVID-19 response. Totally get that. We don't have a problem with that. But what we've seen, particularly in the South Coast region, uh, regulations on refineries, for example, or regulations on warehouses, what's known as the indirect source rule, uh, are looking like they may be postponed uh, because of the environmental uncertainty. Got it. Um I know, we, I know we only have a minute left, but I wanted to kind of close up with anything you wanted to add. Um, I know you have a lot going on, you know, pre-pandemic as well and, and a lot more just afterward. But if there's any, you know, final comments that you'd want to give on that. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and again, thank you for the time uh, for interviewing us and for having interviewed me and, and having us on, on Long Beach Post. I think one of the biggest things to keep in mind, particularly as it relates to air quality and relates to uh, the climate emergency is, yes, these are big overarching issues, and they're issues that may seem overwhelming, but ultimately, we can do something about it. 
And we really must do something about it because it's your health. It's my health. It's everybody's health. Air pollution doesn't respect political lines. It doesn't respect uh, necessarily uh, where you live because it drifts. It certainly impacts more people who live near those sources, but it ultimately affects everybody. And really it's up to us to let our elected leadership know uh, that this is something we care about and that we want cleaner air. Because if we have the same reaction, if we treat air quality like a public, a public health emergency, the public health emergency that it is, we can actually create some significant changes to our air. Again, 40, 30 years ago, our air was much worse than it is now. But as we saw right before the COVID situation, our air pollution levels start ticking back up again because uh, it just kind of became an afterthought. Uh, California, particularly the South Coast Basin, is on track to miss federal clean air standards. The first one's coming up in 2020. We have another one in 2023 and some out to the 2030s. And with absent of the large investments that are needed and absent of stronger regulations and stronger enforcement, uh, we're not going to meet those standards. So certainly this is something that you care about. It's clean air, something that you really, really want to see in this region as well as a healthy climate, we really need to speak up and uh, act in, and let our elected leaders know. Um, Chris Travis, Deputy Policy Director for the Coalition for Clean Air, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And uh, for our viewers tomorrow, you can uh, stay tuned at 1 p.m. as well. My colleague, Jason Luis, is gonna be talking with uh, James Suazo of Long Beach Forward um, about organizing in the age of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you.